This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Um, so well, welcome everybody to the next seminar in our series for this year. Uh, and today it's a, a real pleasure to introduce you to Steve Geary. Um, Steve has actually been here on sabbatical since the, the start of February this year, and he's here until mid-July uh, when he returns via Japan back to the US. Uh, Steve's been a, a figure in the mycoplasma research community for um, probably about 40, 40 or so years, um, and we've been colleagues working on mycoplasma galliseptica for much of that time. Um, and to a large extent, um, both our lab here at the University of Melbourne and Steve's lab have have interacted um, and learned from each other for a long period of time now. And it's been a real pleasure to have him here um, over the last few months and for the next next month and a half. Um, he he gained his PhD from the University of Connecticut, um, then was a postdoc uh, working on mycoplasmas at the University of Missouri. Um, he spent a little bit of time in industry and then went back eventually to the University of Connecticut, where he has been for a number of years until late last year, the um, departmental head um, of the Department of Pathobiology there. Um, so uh, he's, among other things, he's also been um, seconded or um, spent time with the US Department of State um, in the the biological weapons um, affairs office, um, providing advice on microbiological matters there. Uh, but today he's going to talk about um, design of mycoplasma vaccines with a focus on mycoplasma galliseptica.m So I'll, I'll hand over to Steve, and thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Glenn. Um, <clears throat> nice to be here with everybody, and. Um... The focus of uh, my time here on sabbatical, as I told Glenn when we were originally putting this together, that um, working on mycoplasmas would be the easy thing for us to do, but I thought that uh, it'd be good for me to spend some <clears throat> some time learning about something I didn't know a lot about. So that being your antimicrobial stewardship program, uh, it's a very impressive group and a very impressive program. And um, I'm learning a lot and uh, gaining a lot of experience that I'll take back to Connecticut. But, you know, Glenn and I can't stop talking about mycoplasmas also. At one point I thought, well, maybe I'll tell you about what's going on uh, in my lab uh, in that vein. So um, I know a lot of you are very well acquainted with mycoplasmas because of uh, Glenn and his group and all, <clears throat> but I'm going to have to start out um, with a little bit of background um, for those that are not as well versed in it. Um, Let's see one second, I'll share this screen. And what I wanna to try to do is kind of tell a story um, rather than just present data. Let's see. Is that coming through okay to anybody? Yeah, I think, yep, that's good. Okay. <clears throat> so like I say, I kind of wanna talk about how this whole thing unfold and uh, where we are currently and where we're going. So again, I'll try to do it more in a, uh, a story format. So, okay. So gun, my down button isn't allowing this thing to move. What just happened? Oh, maybe it's just slow. You just move, that's right, just yeah. for the first thing. It's slow, okay. So um, again, a little bit of background on mycoplasmas. They're a uh, very interesting group of organisms. Um, one of the main characteristics is that they don't have any cell wall. They're bound by a simple plasma membrane. Um, thus, not being constrained by that cell wall, they have um, very pleomorphic structures. As you can see on the right here, that you can see a variety of different forms that these things take. <clears throat> um, and on the bottom, these are colonies on a longer plate, and they have the characteristic fried egg morphology. They're, they're very tiny, and um, they're not like working with classic bacteria and that uh, colonies you can just lift off the plates and transfer it out. 
these things grow down into the auger, making it more difficult to um, um, to pick them and use them. Again, this is just a, the general background of things. So again, there we used to say they were the smallest self-writing replicating prokaryote, but actually I think the nanobacteria is a little smaller, so we'll call it among the smallest. Some of the other characteristics are that <clears throat> there's limited biosynthetic capabilities. They're unable to synthesize sterols, nucleotides, or fatty acids. Therefore, they require a rich medium for growth. Most are extracellular pathogens. However, um, there are some, uh, and galoceptin is one of them, that there's been um, publications and evidence shown that they can um, go internal and, and replicate. Uh, mycoplasma pneumonia is another one, and there's probably others. But for the most part, they're extracellular pathogens. They also can be found infecting a wide variety of hosts, you know, everything from all mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, and plants. So they're, again, fairly ubiquitous and interesting group of organisms. So the one we're going to focus on today is Mycoplasma galoseptica. I might just refer to it as MG. Um, and uh, the, it's an avian respiratory pathogen. And the pathology uh, is really dependent on the strain that it's presented with. And it does cause some different diseases and different uh, host species in turkeys, as you see up here, they cause infectious sinusitis in chickens, it's chronic respiratory disease, and a house finch, conjunctivitis. And at some point, I'd like to come back to the conjunctivitis aspect because even though it's not really part of the development of the vaccine per se, it's an interesting story and I want to tell you about it. Also, one of my students put up um, slides and they say it's the cause of chronic respiratory disease. I do remind them that, yes, the primary etiology, but there's other factors that go into it also. So it's, um, uh, it's not just a singular pathogen that makes it CRD. Now the economic costs, um, these are in the US. Um, it's really kind of hard to get exact numbers, but the estimates for broilers is that the US loses $588 million per year. And as far as layers, we estimate 132 million uh, loss per year. And quite frankly, I didn't think that sounded like a terrible um, loss, but I guess when you get very few dollars per, per bird now, it's, it mounts up and it is significant. So what's out there for current vaccines? Uh, live vaccines, which seem to be, um, and for good reason to be, the most effective. There's the F-strain vaccine. It has some <clears throat> drawbacks. It's, it's a decent vaccine, but it's pathogenic in turkeys and young chickens. Um, the MG685, uh, another one that's been fairly widely used around the world, um, and it doesn't offer as good protection, so I call it weak protection. Now, the um, TS304, which is a replacement for TS11, overall is very good protection. And of course, you folks are all familiar with that because it was developed here at the University of Melbourne, I guess driven by Kevin Whittier, and uh, with input from, I think, Chris Morrow and Glenn and um, Phil Markham, Glenn can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but anyway, I, I think that's it's overall a very, very good vaccine. <clears throat> now, as far as Bactrins, the one that's uh, for sale now is called MGBAC, and it provides a limited uh, MG control in large flocks and has very limited protection versus field strains. And this is one that we're going to be, uh, we're going to compare our vaccine to all of these, but um, the original impetus was to look at um, comparison to the MG back. So our vaccine um, is going, or is, and um, I should say this is in the process of being developed, um, a subunit galoceptin vaccine, and is based on our knowledge of essential virulence determinants. Any subunit vaccine that's out there and that's worth anything clearly is based on knowledge of pathogenic mechanisms and um, good immunogens. And over the years, we've um, We've been working on elucidating mechanisms of pathogenesis now for a long, long time. And I think we put together a sufficient uh, cohort of pathogenic um, and virulence determinants to uh, take on this venture of a subunit vaccine. So <clears throat> one of the drawbacks, of course, to live attenuated vaccines is always the possibility of reversion to virulence. Quite frankly, I'm not sure how often that happens, but it's always a fear. And um, it's also the uh, justification for us when we go looking for grant money to say, yeah, we got to build something better, okay? So um, <clears throat> that being said, 
our vaccine will maintain a high safety profile with no possibility of reversion to variants. Um, it'll be amenable. This is kind of important. Excuse me. Amenable to rapid modifications by the incorporation of additional MGAL virulence determinants, if needed, or protective antigens from other significant avian pathogens, such as M. synovii. This will all become clear uh, in a moment when I go through this. The, again, premise of this is that it can be modified very rapidly with relevant gene sequences um, that reflect the information and the status of outbreaks and field strains of M. galoseptical. And this hopefully will make sense again in a minute. So our previous work <clears throat> demonstrated that Mg attachment to host cells is mediated primarily through the primary site adhesion molecules, GAP-A and CREM-A. And again, your colleagues <clears throat> here in the University of Melbourne had identified a large VLHA, it's called, stands for variable lipid protein and hemagglutinin, multi-gene family, which encodes these <clears throat> hemagglutinous uh, slash adhesins in M. galoseptical. And again, those people are, again, Bill Markham, uh, Glenn Browning, Kevin Whittier, and I'm sure there's others that have over the years participated in this, but they're the three main um, architects of this that um, I've always associated with this. Um, so the VLHAs are, this is what's been reported and I believe to be true, involved in immunization. With the VLHA phenotype switching and believed to be a random event driven in response to antibodies. And I kind of want you to remember that because this is going to come up in a, a few minutes and uh, I think be quite interesting. They also showed that VLHAs expressed from this gene family can contribute to pathogenesis by binding to epithelial surfaces. <clears throat> now, as I said, the GAP-A and CREM-A are the primary um, cytohesin molecules, but the VLHAs play a role also. And the model to date is that the VLHAs are probably more important in the initial phases of attachment when the Galoseptic um, interfaces with the cilia and the respiratory epithelium, and as it makes its way down to um, the host cell surface, where that's when uh, gap A and creme uh, are more important in solidifying that uh, attachment. So, as I said, tell a story. I have a little note here for myself the Katie Flom story. Katie Flom was a PhD student of mine a number of years ago, and she was going to work on some aspect of galoseptic pathogenesis. And we were looking at a number of different things, um, but we hadn't solidified what it was she was going to do. So I called her to my office one day and said, Katie, I think it's time we try something different. Um, we've, everybody has said that um, you won't be able to get enough signal out of infected hosts in order to look at what's going on with the pathogen, in this case, MG, uh, in in vivo studies. Um, at that point, the next generation sequencing uh, had really developed to the extent that I thought there was possibly a good chance that we could do this. So um, I asked her to try this, and she gladly undertook this uh, study um, and infected some chickens and then um, extracted the RNA and did the analysis. Again, uh, to say that is just kind of a... <clears throat> It doesn't do justice to all the work that really goes into doing this by depleting the host uh, RNA sequences and then enriching for the mycoplasma sequence and um, sequencing it and analyzing it all. But again, she did this and she came to the lab meeting and said, okay, we were able to. She said the, um, the primary and the most overriding uh, sequences that we got were on transporters. And I thought, well, that makes sense. And uh, um, I had another student who uh, I had assigned the task of starting to look into transporters. I think that there hasn't been enough work done on those, and they clearly are extreme importance. As I told you, these um, microbiologists just need to take in so much from their environment. Transporters have to play a, a crucial role in their survival. So, unfortunately, that student didn't pan out, and that story is still sitting somewhere in the lab notebooks. <clears throat> but... Katie said the other thing that showed up very predominantly was uh, were the VLHAs. Oh, that's that's interesting. That's something we should really um, pursue. So, um, so okay, we're going to go ahead and set up studies and um, see what we can find about the um, status of the VLHAs in an in vivo uh, setting. Now, I'll tell you the results here, then I'll show you the data. Our data show that the VLHA phase variation is dynamic throughout the earliest stages of infection, and the pattern of 
dominant VLHA expression is non-stochastic and regulated by a previously unrecognized mechanism or mechanisms, we're not sure. Um, and these data have been important in elucidating the mechanisms for persistence and colonization and overall pathogenesis of MG in the natural host. And more than that, although I think that's terribly interesting, it also provides information critical for the development of our, what we call rationally designed <clears throat> galaceptic vaccine. Now here's the data, okay? And this is, um, these are groups of five birds per group. And we have uninfected birds and galaceptic infected birds. And the difference in our infection process is sometimes we would use um, uh, day zero, day two infection in order to get good, good takes in these birds. However, to do transcript analysis like this on a, um, a timely basis, we just infected them once. So um, we looked at the particular galaceptic on the virulent strain that we're going to be using. It's the R low strain, and uh, it is a very virulent strain. Um, and in analyzing the VLHA content and expression, we know that the VLHA 3.03 was the most highly expressed one in, in vitro also. Um, so when we infected the birds, or I say she infected the birds with help of others in the lab, and then again, five per group and sacrificed them on a daily basis, and then went through and did the um, analysis, it was quite striking uh, what we saw. Uh, I know this chart is, or this graph is kind of complicated or whatever, but here's day zero. We knew 3.03 was the predominant VLHA in the RLO that went in. But its expression level really peaked by day one, and then it starts to slowly tail off. But as that happens, there's others, such as a 4.07 and 5.05 um, that come up, but then they tail off after a couple of days. There are a number of um, VLHAs that are expressed down here in the weeds, but again, we're looking for patterns and predominance. And we saw that mainly as 3.03, by day five was really um, going down. The southern was 4.07 and 3.06 were going up. So again, this is a seven day study. Um, and the things that, again, I think were most striking is that you look at the error bars and all, all birds in the groups all did the same thing. They all went through the same pattern of switching, which again, argued against the uh, random nature of the expression. The other thing was, Clearly, at this stage uh, of infection, the um, the switching is not driven by uh, antibodies. Uh, so uh, something else is going on. So again, two extremely interesting things. And I'm going to, this has been repeated a couple of times, and each time it does the same thing. Now, there was something, this is a little digression, but something kind of curious about the Arlo seems to like 3.03, whether in broth or in the host. We were able to find one culture uh, and froze it when it was expressing the VLHA 2.02 uh, as a predominant one. So that, hmm, okay. If we infect birds with that culture without, without obviously culturing it, that, that um, output population, what would happen? And um, so we did this, but we only did it over a couple, couple of days. We wanted to see what happened. It immediately switched the 3.03 and started following the same pattern of expression. So again, in, in the bird, the mycoplasma uh, does this for a specific reason. I guess you have to be determined. Um, and anytime you took an output population and put it into culture, it would immediately switch back to 3.03. So there's something about 3.03 that um, the gal something likes in, vivo, in vitro and also in the initial phases in vitro. One of the other things that we noticed um, was that um, we would normally let the infections go for a week, two weeks, in order to then assess the lesions. To our surprise, we started seeing classic tracheal thickness lesions uh, and uh, loss of cilia and all as early as two, you know, two and possibly three days. And that was, I'd be curious at the end of this to ask others if they ever noted anything like that, but that was quite striking to us. So. Anyway, this is where Katie then um, had focused the rest of her PhD work. And another student, Jess Baudet, who's married now, named now is Jess Malik, um, and she was taking the, um, uh, the host um, RNA, looking at uh, host transcripts. 
um, because we wanted to see not only what the mycoplasma was doing, but try to get some insights into what's the host doing each time there's a switch uh, and the persistence of the galaceptic, what how is the host trying to counteract this? And as you can imagine, that was her PhD work. Um, there was a, just an enormous amount of data that came out of that. And she uh, tried to focus her work mainly on the immunological pathways, because one of the hallmarks of galaceptic infection is kind of a maladaptive immune response. In other words, you get a massive immune response, but most of it's non-productive and non-protective, um, probably in some type of a disguise or diversionary manner. So anyway, she looked at the host responses, Katie looked at the um, galaceptic response and put together a nice picture. But we'll come back to that one in a minute. And I told you this stuff, didn't I? Oh, so we were, if it's not antibody mediated, what, what could it be? So we believe that the early phase variation is driven in part by alterations in the cellular architecture of the trachea during infection. As the infection progresses, host cells experience denuding of cilia, squamous cell metaplasia, and eventual destruction of host cell membranes. So we hypothesize that MG and VLHA expression is changing in response to these alterations and the pathogen expressing, again, specific, that's why I put it in talk, specific sets of VLHAs genes the, um, to best persist in the current environment. Um, so the consistent pattern of expression provides a basis for inclusion of the VLHAs in our vaccine and is the reason we believe the current Galaceptic and Bactrin vaccine is poorly protective. Um, when I say poorly protective, the data seems to indicate it's closer to the F strain um, in protection, but not as good as uh, TS304. <clears throat> but in a sense, if the VLHAs play a significant role um, in the pathogenic process, it all kind of makes sense because the Bactrin uh, freezes the expressed antigens in, in the state when it's killed. So you don't get any VLHA switching. So the VLHAs have also been shown to be um, protective antigens, and they haven't done any exhaustive, uh, this group did not do any exhaustive work on that, but going back in the literature, we found that prior to the um, elucidation of the VLHAs by the Melbourne group, this fellow named Sato uh, demonstrated that chicken anti-29 kilodalton MG peptide, antistem to that MG peptide, inhibited the growth of Galaceptigum in vitro and provided a partial protection to chickens from challenge um, in vivo. And it was later determined that this peptide was a portion of one of the VLHAs, again, demonstrating a possible role for the VLHAs as protective antigens in our minds, justifying their inclusion uh, in our vaccine. So we acknowledge that subunit vaccine technology isn't new, but again, our approach and rationale for antigen selection based on the data that we've generated from experiments over all these years on mechanisms of pathogenesis is novel. So our hypothesis again is that chickens vaccinated with this vaccine will generate not only anti-GAP-A and anti creme a the primary attachment molecule uh, antibodies, but they'll also generate anti-VLHA neutralizing antibodies to each of the specific VLHAs dominantly expressed during the initial phase of infection. Now, again, we, we can add in as many as we want, but to take the most highly expressed in the early phase, and that's what I'm saying the first seven days, seems to make the most sense. So that's what we, um, we did. And the, our thought is that in the face of uh, such a repertoire of preformed anti-GAPA and anti-CREMI and anti-VLHA antibodies, the galaceptium that's attempting to infect the host will be assaulted by specific antibodies that'll minimize their abilities to attach and those that do manage to attach will be met by anti-VLHA antibodies each time it attempts to switch to a successive one. And here's a, a cartoon um, depicting this. In the top, um, showing the beginning normal architecture, the ciliated epithelial cells with the VLHAs. Again, we're showing attachment in the cilia. Different color VLHAs are to demonstrate, or to depict rather, the different highly expressed VLHA at the time. And as you progress down this ladder, you see a different VLHA as there is some switching or denuding of the cilia going on. And again, until it gets down to squamous epithelium. 
And again, in our vaccine, it all works well on paper, but we'll see what happens in real life. Um, we have antibodies to all of these VLHAs and the gap and creme. So we should be able to knock down the original attachment. And then any of those, such as this one that does get through, um, will be, again, assaulted by preformed antibodies generated by our vaccine and hopefully um, capable of neutralizing it and then by other um, natural um, innate systems, eliminate it. And again, all works well on paper. We'll see. So this slide, um, I, I and others tend to just go over this too quickly. Um, this is just showing the expressed, as you can see over here, um, and purified GAP A, CREM A, and the VLHAs, 3.03, 3.06, 4.07, and 5.05. Now, again, I say it's, it doesn't do the person justice who's doing all this. And Jeremy Miller is my PhD student who's tasked with uh, developing this vaccine. And again, I have to stress that other people in the lab um, are assisting, but he's he's primary. And uh, you know, so we um, we wanted to um, express. We had to have these um, different genes synthesized and then um, transfect and, and and transform rather and uh, express and purify these. And again, it just sounds like, yeah, yeah, just do it. You know, any of you who have done this before know that there are a lot of a lot of bumps in the road when you do this. So I don't want to shortchange Jeremy's efforts in this. Uh, he did a great job. Um, he did clip off uh, uh, galaceptinum signal sequences and use E. coli sequences and um, also had to convert the uh, trip, mycoplasma tryptophan codons to coli. Is something I should mention earlier, possibly, is that another unique feature of mycoplasmas is that they use a universal stop codon to encode tryptophan. So clearly, you, you're not going to get full length expression of these things uh, in coli with that. So they all had to be converted. So he did that. And um, also, they were his tagged. And typical is to uh, tag with cis, cis histidines, six histidines, if I can talk. And, um, and then again, purify them over a nickel column. Um, and he was hitting, gap and cram may work pretty well, and the VLHAs uh, were somewhat variable. Um, he was getting expression into um, inclusion bodies and uh, had to work around that, vary some parameters, and also the binding onto the nickel column. He found that he found, uh, you know, congratulations to him by reading the literature, that um, having 10 histidine instead of six worked much better. Um, so again, this took quite a while, and now he's got it down uh, pat, so uh, they can start expressing these things. But again, it was a lot of work, and I don't want to just blow over this as, yeah, see, they're they're pretty good. Um, also, uh, I want to be able to do these experiments as we come up with the ideas. Now, and I keep telling Jeremy and others, I want you to continue to purify these on a continual basis. I want to have a stock of these so that we can just pull them off the shelf and uh, ready to go. We've already assessed um, purities and concentrations and all, and I don't want to have to wait, you know, for a month or two to generate more. So I want you to do it continually. And, um, you know, he's, he's a good kid. He's <laughs> been doing that and then also employed some undergrads taught them how to do this. And they're getting a lot of experience and are doing this also. Um, at a recent meeting with one of my former PhD students, when discussing some of this, he said, yeah, I got to remind you one of Dr. Yuri's favorite um, sayings. He says, there's 24 hours a day and you're a grad student. I said, well, I didn't think I was that bad. But anyway, um, in other words, uh, yeah, these things are important and we can't, can't waste time. Um, our animal um, experimental facilities are in quite high demand. And if you, once you get out of their facilities, there's others waiting to take your place, and that's going to delay things also. So again, it was important to have these things ready to go, and Jeremy's done a, a great job with that. So our initial experiment, um, we use um, four-week-old um, SPF white leghorn chickens, and we use 10 per group, and we do this in isolator units. Yeah, our isolator units are <clears throat> very similar to the ones I saw out in Werribee, although you have many more of them and some larger, but um, they're basically the same. Uh, although I'm kind of jealous, maybe I'd like to 
ask you guys if you want to work with us and do some of these experiments with us. Anyway, when the birds arrive, they're pre-bled and tagged. And I should mention that this is all done under uh, an approved IACUC protocol. So the first go around, it's kind of a guess how much to use. So we decided to use 10 micrograms per, uh, per subunit, a subunit being, you know, GAP A, CRAM A, and the VLHAs for a total of 60 micrograms. And we we're kind of curious, although we, you know, um, logic tells you you're going to need a, an adjuvant, we decided we want to try it first without an adjuvant and also in conjunction with an adjuvant. Um, we used a commercial adjuvant, Ativax. Um, the MG back is an oil and water, has an oil and water vac, uh, adjuvant, and this Ativax seemed to be close to what probably in that. We decided to try that one first. Um, so each uh, vaccine is administered subcutaneously in 500 microliters on, on day zero, and then boost 500 microliters on two weeks later. Two weeks following that, um, the chickens were challenged, and we challenged them intratracheally. Um, I noticed that you folks are doing an aerosol method, and yours is probably a much more, it is, it's a much more realistic, natural infection. But the way we've been doing it over the years, we know that we want to get X number of mycoplasmas, in this case, one times 10 to the eight, um, down into the trachea. And this is one way of assuring that they get that amount. Even though you get that amount and it's consistent, <laughs> the, the takes somewhat vary also. But anyway, this is the way we do it. And the positive control group was sham vaccinated with um, PBS, with Ativax, and then again, challenged with Arlo. Negative group um, just got PBS for both vaccination and challenge. And two weeks post um, challenge, the birds were sacrificed and tracheal sub segments were taken for uh, recovery of MG, histologic analysis, um, uh, immune tracheal washes for immune assessments, um, yeah, a schematic of that. And actually we took them from both ends, the um, proximal and distal ends for culture. Um, and the next section is histopath, tracheal washes for um, um, secreted antibody response, and then triazole washes to look at um, RNA. Well, the thing that I was, or we are primarily interested in with that, um, we're kind of curious to see any output mycoplasma that are there, which VLHA might they be expressing at that point? So um, we haven't gotten to that stat, uh, state yet, but that's the rationale. So this slide, um, if you can follow the arrow down here, um, this is from a different experiment, but it, it um, shows you what I want to um, depict in this whole thing. And this is a, after a PBS challenge. Um, and also Hayflix broth, also the same thing, looks the same. You can see the classic uh, columnar epithelial with the cilia intact and um, the mucosal layer, um, um, I call it fairly thin. In contrast to one where um, this is a bird that's just been infected with uh, Galacepticum R low, and you can see that the complete loss of um, tracheal uh, cilia and the uh, epithelial layers are more squamous cell at this point, plus a large thickening of the um, mucosa. Now that's full, full of um, immune cells, histocytes, and um, again, most of that is non-productive as far as um, a defensive system. And, and again, it's just called maladaptive. Um, now, Glenn and I have talked about this in the past too, but when you look at the circumference of a trachea, um, histologically, and you measure them, we don't get a complete circumferential thickening like this. Many times you'll see thickening in discrete locations uh, and not in others. Um, so that goes into the analysis. We've been, we have a, a rubric whereby we measure them at four locations and um, take the averages. And then we also, if we, because you can see sometimes that if we do it at 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock, you might miss a lesion to say at four o'clock that doesn't fit into your rubric. So we do add in what we call just the large, um, the largest lesion seen that's not at those sites. Um, more recently, and that meaning in the last three or four months, 
we found a, um, uh, a program, a computer program that you can use, uh, digital pathologists use this uh, for assessing the thickness of the epithelial layer and the submucosa um, in a more computerized way, uh, looking at the whole circumference. And that's something we're, we're going back and looking at old data now and seeing how it correlates. Um, but we, I can't show you any of that now because we don't have it finished. So we're, we're staying with the tracheal thickness data that we have. So how did this vaccine work? <clears throat> FM1, the formulation one is again, not adjuvanted and FM2 is. Now you look at the tracheal thickness and I know that also you folks, and we did it initially and we'll do it kind of casually now. We look at the air sacs because I know air sac lesions are something that is looked for at um, um, time of post of birds for production. Um, however, the lesions are so variable and there's just nothing consistent about it. You can't really make a consistent story. However, the thickness of the trachea is a very consistent parameter. And so that's what we've been focusing on. So again, if, if you look at the, um, this is just a sham vaccine and sham uh, um, exposed birds versus the ones that um, were given the RLO, non-vaccinated given the RLO, and then versus our um, formula one without any adjuvant and um, then the one with adjuvant. And as you can see that there is a significant difference uh, between the uh, variant RLO and our, our vaccine with the adjuvant. The, the, distance, the difference between the unadjuvanted and the adjuvanted one uh, it's not statistically significant, but you can see that there is a trend. But again, with the Adivax adjuvant, it seemed to work pretty well, as expected. I think anybody who's worked in vaccines knows that that's likely going to happen. Another measurable output, which is uh, significant, is um, recovery, um, number of uh, microplasma recovered. And as you can see, especially our um, adjuvanted vaccine did a fairly good job, knocked down almost two logs. Um, this graph is to show more of a um, temporal um, uh, recovery pattern. And you can see that the recoveries of the ones that were in the advent group were, were greatly delayed. As far as um, immune assessments, and there's been some, uh, I guess there's been a lot of discussion about um, what's most indicative and correlates with protection. You know, the secreted antibodies, uh, local antibodies in trachea versus serum antibodies. And we're looking at um, both. Um, however, the serum antibodies were the ones that were easiest to assess right away. So we looked at coating the plates with gap A and creme and looking at the uh, responses. And actually, you can see that um, our adjuvant did a, a very good job. All the subunit components also were seen very effectively by the birds. And also, if you just put the um, VLHAs in there by themselves, um, they were, it's interesting, they, they were not as immunogenic as um, in the gap A and creme, however, significant. The, over here, we coated the plates with just MG lysate, and the reason for doing that is because whenever you're expressing um, uh, proteins, we're commonly expressing proteins, you're kind of hoping you're going to get the same confirmation and uh, immunological stimulation that you would in a natural situation. So we wanted to make sure that our, we coat the plates with MG, that our induced antibodies from our vaccine was um, seeing the right thing. And it appears they are. We were then interested in seeing um, about the um, uh, VLHAs individually. How were they, um, how were they seen in this whole mixture? Um, it's, it appears that the 4.07, Either there's a much better image in or whatever, but it's uh, significantly got a significantly better response, especially compared to 5.05. And I can't tell you anything of any significance other than the fact that, okay, uh, all of them were being seen, uh, antibodies are made to them, some better than others. So I would say that our subunit vaccine is, uh, uh, is approached or is reaching a significant reduction in tracheal thickness, um, uh, recovery of bacterial load in the trachea, and it induces antibody responses against all the major components of the subunit vaccine. And again, notably against the, the life site. Um, we're just wrapping up another experiment, um, which we modified um, and are using 50 micrograms of each subunit. Um, we want to compare it to the MG back 
ultimately, but we didn't do it in this uh, follow-up experiment. And we want to assess uh, various adjuvants. There are a number of them that we're going to be looking at. Um, and we decided to pursue that aspect with the increased concentrations of the subunits um, for our, our next study. And something we're going to look at in the end also is determining the efficacy of this vaccine against heterologous galaceptical strains. Because again, it's many times when you make a vaccine against a certain strain, it's maybe highly protective against homologous strain and not so much against heterologous. And we're hoping that our vaccine is going to be um, protective against heterologous. And if not, we can add components in there to make it more so. I'll explain that a little better in a minute. Um, but if this vaccine is successful, it'll be safe, effective, and immediately adaptable to the incursion of different field strains of galaceptical. So again, um, if we have an arrival of another um, galaceptical field strain that's, say, um, presenting a different suite of VLHAs, um, we can assess the VLHA expressions, as we did previously in this one, and see which ones are most highly expressed over the initial time course again. And we can either add to or swap out um, these uh, VLHAs in the, um, in the next iteration of the vaccine. We are planning to use, I'm going to go back to the um, uh, house finish story for a minute. Um, we've had a project for a long, long time in collaboration with the Lab of Ornithology at uh, Cornell University and a group at Virginia Tech. Um, this actually has been quite a good um, collaboration. So when I first started approaching them to work on this, um, I found that they know an awful lot about birds, nothing about mycoplasmas. We know a fair amount about mycoplasmas and nothing about birds. So it's actually kind of a match made in heaven for us to kind of pool our strengths and um, be modest about our weaknesses. And we've had um, a long collaboration with them. Long story short, we have the the initial jump from um, poultry to um, songbirds, the finch, um, occurred in uh, 94. And it was first noted in Virginia. And we have the index isolate and just referred to as Virginia 94. The, um, um, the spread of Galaceptica and house finches uh, throughout the country, it kind of took a northerly track up through New York and across the plains out to California and another southerly track down through the Carolinas to Georgia. It didn't, it still hasn't really made its way to the Southwest, but nonetheless, and what we we're interested in is looking at these different isolates from these different places and see how it, how it changed over time um, to see if we could, how is it adapting? Uh, is it becoming more pathogenic or whatever? So I don't want to get off too much on that because it's a whole different topic, but um, suffice to say that we've um, sequenced a number of these um, house finch isolates. Now the gap and creme don't really vary that much, one or 2% probably on the amino acid level, but the VLHAs are interesting. Some of them have just completely different suites of VLHAs. Some of them have similar, but additional ones. Others have similar, but lesser ones, fewer of them. Some have been dropped out. So the complement of VLHAs varies greatly in these. So ultimately at one point we want to take Virginia 94 and see, use that to challenge our vaccinated birds and see what happens. Again, a little digression. We know that um, if we take Virginia 94, House finch strain and put it in the eyes of chickens, it doesn't do anything. But if you put it into the respiratory tract as our normal challenge, it does. It'll cause lesions. Um, and of course, we can put galaceptic on the eyes of house finch, it doesn't do anything either. But the point is that Virginia 94 does cause uh, respiratory lesions um, in, in the chicken. So that with a very diverse set of VLHAs um, will be an interesting one to see if we get protection. Um, and again, if not, then as the situation arises, we will be able to, again, I keep beating this, but rapidly identify and modify the vaccine to suit that purpose. Um, so again, as I said, we've, we're have we just wrapping up this other experiment and um, we tested two other adjuvants, Montanide uh, ISA 78VG and also alum. Now the Montanide, which is supposed to be for avian species, uh, resulted in unacceptable granuluminous lesions at the sites of injection. Every one of these birds had this um, caseous lesions, that's the right term, um, uh, which made it just uh, unjustifiable to pursue that adjuvant further. Alum, however, didn't leave any, um, any lesions and 
initial looks at trachea lesions, looks like it performed fairly well. So now, uh, just as a wrap-up comment, I'm going to say that I told you early on that um, we looked at host responses to the VLHA, I'm sorry, to the uh, galaseptic infection in that seven-day course study. And because again, we wanted to see what was what was happening. And again, found an awful lot of data. And Jess did, a, I think, a yeoman's job in trying to do, um, decipher what all this was. Um, so I want to follow up to that. And this project is um, honchoed primarily by Larry Silbar and Jess Malik. Um, and I have a student who's now a PhD student of mine, but Grace Ozick, who um, undertook this. Now, their idea is to silence some of the genes on the pathways leading up to this maladaptive response. So they've been able to de uh, determine which one of these multiple pathways are responsible for this maladaptive response. And the idea is, can we not, we, you know, they, whatever, um, silence some of the genes intermediate in the pathways to um, stop um, that ultimate maladaptive response? And would that help to contribute to um, the success of a vaccine? So they're using an siRNA approach, um, and Grace has, um, they picked out three particular genes they feel are um, important in, this in these pathways. And she has um, used the siRNAs in cell culture and found, I think, at least 80% knockdown, which is actually quite good for all of them. Now working with a professor in chemistry uh, who's a nanoparticle expert, um, they've put these siRNAs onto nanoparticles, and they've put one class of siRNA on one nanoparticle and said done three individual ones and also put the three siRNAs on one nanoparticle. Um, and that's being assessed now initially in cell culture. Um, and again, I think this is kind of a fascinating way of doing it. If you can redirect the immune system to allow a vaccine to actually do a better job, um, kind of analogous to an adjuvant, right? Um, I think this would be uh, tremendously important. Um, this work has a long way to go. And uh, any of you folks who might be at the IOM in Osaka uh, will hear Grace presenting this. So who are the people doing this work? Jeremy Miller is a PhD student who is doing the um, um, subunit vaccine work. Grace is doing the uh, siRNA work. Um, Eden Tellman and Steve Sapanek and Jess Malik are all co-PIs with me on the grant from the USDA NEFA and also funds from the Center of Excellence for Vaccine Research. And it's, uh, again, we've got a long way to go, but I think we've got some um, interesting uh, initial data. And uh, I'll stop here and try to answer any of your questions. Thanks very much, Steve. It was fascinating. Um, has anybody got any, there's a few claps, virtual claps out there, but um, <laughs> just trying to see if there's nothing in the chat at the moment. So while people have, oh no, Nadika's got a hand up. So I'll, Nadika, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, it was interesting. I would like to hear what happened with the a small RNA one as well. <laughs> um, question is, so you said like, will the VLHA changes when the host change? Like when you infect, you had like certain VLHAs coming up at different times. What if the host change, like if you do use a different host, like a turkey or a, even a different type of a bird? For in, in this case, it's SPF, I'm assuming. Right. Yeah? right. So let's say it's a commercial bird. Yeah. Uh, will that change? Have, have you had a look at if that changes? Well, you know what? I, that's a good point. And again, um, I would say, I guess this is in its infancy, but we have to start somewhere and we have to do it under defined circumstances where we control as much as we can in order to try to um, describe what's going on. I would expect that when you have birds that are in more of a natural setting and exposed to other other organisms, that it, that might very well influence the expression of the um, um, VLHAs. However, that's something that we have to uh, right now convince ourselves and others that this is going down the right path and has some real probability the vaccine work we do at the center is all um, proof of concept work. We never get into any any manufacturer. We try to um, align ourselves with companies that are interested in taking it further. And uh, we're at the stage of trying to, again, generate enough data that we think that may be of interest to them. Yeah, 
thank you. Thanks, Nadeka. Um, I thought I saw another hand go up, but uh, it seems to have gone down again. So maybe I can ask my question because it's a bit of a follow on. I, I guess I was wondering, do you have any transcriptomic data on the house finch isolate in, in house finches so that you'd be able to guide you about which which VLHAs you might include if you're trying to develop a house finch vaccine? Um, no. And the thing is, um, we wouldn't really be looking to develop a house finch vaccine, but we would, we're would. we using that as kind of a surrogate. We know it's out in the field as a heterologous um, field strain uh, that we have characterization of the VLHAs and all. So no, we have not looked at um, the house finch part because we're more concerned with the um, poultry part. Thank you. Uh, Marshall. Um, thanks very much. I enjoyed that very much. So talking about vaccines, something near to my heart. Um, for a chicken vaccine, uh, I don't have any idea of the um, of the likely cost implications, but for something that's a recombinant, um, what's your uh, productivity like and is it likely to be able to translate into something that could be feasibly used in a commercial setting? Yeah, well, actually, I was hoping there would be some people here in the commercial world who could uh, shed some light on that. Uh, again, at this stage, it's proof of concept. And I think that the, the whole idea of its pliability, uh, adaptability, and all um, may override a little higher cost. But again, we're not in a position to really do any cost analysis since we're not uh, an industrial setting. Um, could I make a comment, Glenn? Sure. Um, uh, Feel free, Marshall, because you know. If you, were, if you were able to express these in a um, uh, in the same organism, like co-express the the antigens you're using in the same organism, um, you you already have a commercial Bacterin um, vaccine that you told us about in the beginning. And um, maybe if you had ex uh, expression high enough, you might be able to use that, you know, a Bacterin rather than something that requires purification and so on. No, that's that's true. Um, getting getting um, um, recombinant mycoplasmas, the, um, the genetic tools available to do this are uh, really not very good. Most of them have been just by transposon mutagenesis and insertions with transposons. I know Glenn's group is able to get some um, done with their, their plasmid. And I suppose one other time you could try to put them in there. And uh, you're right, it would make sense if you could do something like that. And again, you'd be using it then um, as in that case, um, I guess it would be a, a, a Bactrin, right? A background expressing these different answers, but I mean that's that's a that's an idea. Yeah, or Marshall, were you thinking about putting them all into E. coli and using the E. coli vector as the the basis for the background? Um, look, I, I just made the comment because um, Charles managed to get something expressed that we use for hydatid disease at such a high level that uh, it works perfectly well as uh, simply a clarified E. coli lysate. Um, and whether it was E. coli or some other expression system, uh, I guess might not matter, but it was really in the context of uh, it working in our experience and also that there's al already something uh, licensed for chickens using uh, a Bactrin. So uh, that, was, that would mean it would be a step that wouldn't need to be uh, across as an extra, I would imagine. Right, right. You know, it's funny you say that because uh, Eden... Eden said this too, when we we're having difficulty with some of the um, purifications, he said, you know, in the old days, you just sliced it and just did it. You don't need all this. And I suppose it's, that's true. But we're trying to actually define the, the, um, the roles of these different ones too um, in this whole process. So, you know, we're, we're taking this vaccine development from an academic standpoint also, it's because we want to know. And also with the understanding that, yes, it's got to be commercially viable. We understand that. And, you know, I like the way that um, the folks here have worked with, um, um, bioproperties in developing vaccines because you're guided by the people there as to um, how to do this and what's needed so you don't have to just go back and repeat things. People like myself and our groups tend to try to develop things that work and then take them to commercial people and say, yeah, but you should have done this right from the start. So um, yeah, 
Uh, I wish we had a partnership with some like uh, bioproperties to do this along the way. I think we've sometimes had that said to us as well. But, um, Vern, Vern Bowles put a question in the chat and he had to duck off to another meeting. So he asked me to, to put it to you. He, he said there's there's a number of different montanide adjuvants available. Um, and he's just wondering how you selected the montanide that you used and uh, would it be worthwhile trying a different version of montanide um, rather than not use montanide at all? Well, you know, that's, that's true. So, um, um, again, Jeremy's actually quite a resourceful young grad student and he's contacted the company and um, they've given him a lot of information. As a matter of fact, they donated this free because they wanted to see it used. Um, and they have a couple others that they, one of them is not on the market yet, they, but they'd love to see some um, experimental data with it. So we haven't included that, but he's right. There are other Montanite formulations, but that particular one we use, we're not going to go any farther with. And again, alum, you know, alum's a tried and true vaccine uh, adjuvant. And it's so far, because we're not finished so far, it's looking pretty good. But there are a number of other ones Oh, it's the PAM3 and PAM2 uh, systems and, um, oh, shoot, some other oil and water ones. There's, there's about four more that we're going to look at before we do much else. But we, we think we've probably hit on uh, a good quantity of the individual um, components of the vaccine. Um, Steve Sapanek likes to say you like to take the sledgehammer approach and put in as much as you can, because if that doesn't work, it's not going to. So we think that the 60, uh, 50 micrograms is a, a good uh, a good amount for us at this point. Yeah, um, I don't know whether the, the Greg Underwood was here earlier, but I don't know whether he's, he may have left. No, Greg, you're still here. Greg, do you know whether any particular montanides have been used in commercial vaccines in poultry at all? I have a feeling some of them had been used in Bactrins. Maybe Greg's walked away from his computer. We'll ask him some other time, um, unless he, he comes back. Uh, did anybody else have any questions for Steve? Look like oh. check chat. Well, if not, you know, I'm going to be around, as Glenn said, for a while longer. And um, yeah, happy to meet with you and talk with you. I hope it stimulated some interest with some of you. And um, yeah, I'd like to hear your suggestions and comments. So. Thank And thanks very much, Steve. It was a really interesting talk. Um, and yes, it'd be good to see how it goes with your next round of experimentation. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Goodbye.